campus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is the setting for the 1979 Jacob Bronowski Memorial Lecture. In 1978, the British Broadcasting Corporation instituted an annual television lecture in honor of the internationally known scientist philosopher, Dr. Jacob Bronowski, who died in 1974. The special purpose of these lectures is to celebrate and commemorate the role that Bronowski played in the development of what might be called the art form of making scientific television programs. The lectures are to be concerned with science and its relationship with the non-scientific world. Dr. Bernofsky, who created the television series, The Ascent of Man, was an inspired communicator who helped to interpret the mysteries of the physical world to the layman through first radio and then television. The second memorial lecture is given by Dr. Philip Morrison, who is introduced by the provost of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Dr. Walter Rosenblith. Philip Morrison is an extraordinary human being in addition to being an extraordinary scientist. He's capable of evoking in any field of science, the human aspects in addition to the most advanced thinking. He became one of the world's great theoretical astrophysicists in a period in which that field came out of its medieval era, in the time when quasars, nebulae, X-ray astronomy, supernovae made their impact upon our thinking. He became interested not only in the origin of the cosmos, but also in the origin of life. The fact is that he has been concerned with science, not only as theoretical science, not only theoretical physics from where he started, but with science on its effect on human beings, on societies, and how they interacted with them. In some other way, probably he has been marked forever by his work on the Manhattan Project, by the fact that he was so dramatically associated with the first atom bomb by carrying the plutonium core in his lap. And ever since then, he has spoken out forcefully and informally about the potential nuclear holocaust. But he's not only that, he's also the wise reviewer of books in science in, along all the range of the sciences. And he's a unique person to interpret science to children, to poets, to peers, and therefore entirely a natural choice for the Bromowski Lecture. Thank you. I'm moved to f recall the days of World War II when a loosely knit but intense community of science and technology spanned the Atlantic between the British on the one hand and the Americans on the other side. Thousands of persons earnestly engaged in waging that terrible war, anxious for the best ideas and the best criticism on how the weapons of war, the new weapons, the radar, the aircraft, all those things which arose at that time could be used in the search for the precious victory. And that was the first time that I encountered the mind of Jacob Bernowski when, from writing from a little English village halfway between Oxford and London, a series of penetrating and iconoclastic 
papers appeared, which caused a buzz of concern and interest, helpful buzz of concern throughout that entire community. The shuttle of war tangled our experiences even more closely just at the end of the war, when I, for my part, was sent by our government to walk the rusty ruin of Hiroshima to reflect upon what had happened there and to measure and report. And he, quite independently, was sent by the UK government on a similar errand. We didn't encounter each other, we didn't know of it, until later on, months later, when we read mutually the reports of that galvanizing experience. A few years later, again by chance, we each arrived at MIT to spend a visiting year. And from that time on, our paths were distinct, separated often by continents and by oceans, but always together in the sense that we were communicative friends who from time to time enjoyed each other's company. And I want to begin by pursuing a theme which was his own theme in that rich legacy of idea and image which he called the ascent of man. This is the Pacific Ocean. The California Indians used to say that at full moon the fish came and danced on these beaches. And it's true that there is a local variety of fish, the grunion, that comes up out of the water and lays its eggs above the high tide mark. The females bury themselves tail first in the sand and the males gyrate or dance around them and fertilize the eggs as they're being laid. The full moon is important because it gives nine or ten days between these very high tides and the next ones that will wash the hatched fish out to sea again. Every landscape in the world is full of these exact and beautiful adaptations by which an animal fits into its environment like one cogwheel into another. Millions of years of evolution have shaped the grunion to fit and sit exactly with the tides. But nature, that is evolution, has not fitted man to any specific environment. On the contrary, by comparison with the grunion, he has a rather crude survival kit. And yet, this is the paradox of the human condition, one that fits him to all environments. His imagination, his reason, his emotional subtlety and toughness make it possible for him not to accept the environment, but to change it. And that series of inventions by which man from age to age has remade his environment is a different kind of evolution, not biological, but cultural evolution. I call that brilliant sequence of cultural peaks the ascent of man. Let us take up the challenge of that paradox. We are not the only creatures who change the environment. Most do something of that sort. But how we do it, and the degree in which we do it, and above all the rate at which that change occurs, are the significant features that I think I can tease out of our own condition. Now, curiously enough, the somewhat odd title which we have chosen for these remarks this evening, Termites and Telescopes, is based on this idea that I've just put forward, added to a, a school day's experience of my own. When somehow, I cannot recall the, the book that was there, somehow I encountered in a book the strange remark that the mark, the criterion of true civilization, of real civilization, was the ability to construct the true arch. 
Now, I don't know what architectural critic or thoughtful student of, of cultures made that remark, which I regard as absurd, <laughs> a, way, a way primarily to exclude the Mayans from a discussion by a man who probably understood very well Greek and Latin was very poor in the, in the older languages. But that remark stuck in my mind, as, as chance remarks do. And a couple of years ago, I was astonished, thinking along the lines of Ascent of Man, to encounter the clear demonstration, explicit evidence, that there are social insects, in fact, certain species of termites, which I will speak about, which in fact construct the true arch. And therefore it is my task, if I'm to understand the nature of man, the nature of termite, if we were to consider that, we must at least uh, absolve ourselves from this requirement to admit the termites to the or perhaps to admit them we should do, I don't know, to enter them into the, uh, the coterie of the true civilizations. And it turns out that when you examine not simply this little criterion, of course it's always at these simple gates, dear to examination setters, but very poor for real science, if you look and see how they make the true art, which they do, and compare it with how we make the true arches, which from time to time we do, the how makes a world of significance in the distinction. And that is what I want to talk about. And I will try to say, I think I'll have to say some strange things in the course of drawing conclusions from this difference. In order to bring a little sense of what the termites are like, we have at our disposal a short film, quite a beautiful film made in Australia. Here is a landscape dominated by termites. Each termite nest is a city of creatures. There they are, blind for the most part, 100 or 200,000 living in a single nest. These nests endure for decades, and the busy termites build and maintain them and live out their lives in such communities. Governed, it is fairly plain by complex rules of social behavior. Here you see the queen mother. She is, of course, the queen mother. All the members of the nest are a sing not only a city, but a family. Some hundreds of thousands of her offspring people the nest of the termites. This creature is tended by specialists, fed, cared for, groomed, guarded in every way. Here you see more workers moving about the eggs, caring for the eggs and the larvae of the next generation with solicitude. Their communication is tactile and, of course, chemical. It's precise chemical signals, a few of which are now known, are transferred between the individuals. The white form, of course, is a larva. The specialized workers and even more specialized soldier forms, which we should soon see, in the first stages look alike. Well, no one is quite sure in all species whether their inbuilt differences, which will be apparent, are... You see, the mandibles of this fierce soldier, his jaws fitting him to guard the nest entrance. In the first stages, he came from just such a little white, tame larva as any other worker. Whether it is subsequent treatment or whether there's some genetic difference, it's not absolutely certain. Here they are taking into the nest the wood, the source of the cellulose, from which, by the use of symbiotic bacteria, they derive most of their energy. There are thousands of species of termites, and the differences are not unimportant. Therefore, I can talk only in the most generalized and approximate way. But I do want to think I'm mislead when I talk about what seem to be among the most advanced of the termite species, uh, a principal member of a genus of African termites, which carries everything to an extreme. These termites are larger, their nests are larger still than the Australians. The population of nests may well run to two million individuals. The queen is the mother of all, and she lives 10 or 15 times the average life of a worker, so during her lifetime she gives rise to tens of millions of offspring, any two million of which may be occupying the nest at a given time. They are agriculturists. There seems little doubt that the fungus species found inside the nest of these termites which is known in some cases by experiment to be indispensable for their livelihood, for their welfare, is found nowhere else save in contact with these animals. 
It is tended, sown, cropped, reaped, propagated, and re-sown by the termites, season after season, a special fungus. That nest shows you the central region of many chambers where the fungus garden is kept and tended by the horticulturists blindly in the dark. Now notice the support structure of the nest. Notice how open the structure of the nest is. This is indispensable. These organisms must maintain a humidity and temperature condition, a flow of air adequate for their own welfare, for that of the larvae, and for that of the fungus garden upon which they depend. No crude, of course there are many species that have many cruder nests without such architectural features, but these advanced termites could not really survive without some means of making a structure which was airy as well as strong, which could be as large as it has to be, and yet allow the passage of air in, with natural convection, sometimes even with forced convection, to the insects moving to assist the air in its motion to uh, play its role. Now, what has been learned in the past 10 or so years by remarkable studies of these animals in the field is the mechanism by which the termites can build, macro termites, as you see it in this picture at the left, can build the true arch. Consider what the task is. It begins with a hollow lens-shaped chamber in the ground, first excavated by many termite workers, scurrying around in the dark, blind insects. And apparently randomly, though there may be some less than completely random interaction, they start making uh, at a certain point. Those signals we do not know. We know only some. We can infer only some of the prograic constructions which these animals must bear within themselves. But some we can see. They begin hundreds working in the dark to assemble the materials from which the architecture we built. This is called carton. It is the chewed up excreted wood fiber mixed with a cement that they secrete and it makes little pellets which then can be glued together to build up a structure as you see a durable structure of meters high and decades of durability. Now to begin with there are simply these thousand scurrying insects in the dark each one individually making a little pile of pellets and then at some point apparently they understand their signal a little programmatic remark says when you have built a pile for a certain amount of time or for a certain degree of, uh, of success in pelletizing, abandon your pile if there is within your purview, within your senses, we don't know how that's done, whether it's by odor or by moisture, various possibilities exist, a larger pile. If there is, drop yours and go to work on the larger pile. So instead of a thousand small piles, of course by chance some are a little larger than the others, there are now perhaps a hundred piles, two or three times larger than their neighbors, scattered over the floor of the cell. The others are abandoned, and the large ones now start to grow, with many insects working on each one. A third important signal arises out of the system. If you have a column at a certain height, and there is no column nearby of an adequate height, Abandon the column you're working on and join one which belongs to a pair. And there you see the insects who have found a pair of columns and obey the fourth instruction which says when the pair close enough, because they had to be close enough, chosen by random uh, events, were close enough so they might have a chance of being bridged together, work on the top until you bridge them across with the cemented wood fibers that make the true arch. <laughs> and there you have termite, true civilization, <laughs> and its architecture. I think it is, it's an extraordinary, if not an awesome, uh, statement. Notice that it is a, an affair without symmetry, without plan, with no blueprint, with no fixed outcome. The outcome is purely functional. There will be in the mean enough arches, enough sufficiently spaced to support the structure. But no two nests will have the same plan. There will be no Palladian school. The situation will have about it a curiously effective and yet to human eyes and minds a curiously random pattern. The blueprint exists nowhere 
It arises out of the interaction of the insects with some cues, admittedly we don't know, some inbuilt instructions that we don't know, but with several other important cues that come from the structure itself upon which they're working. And that is enough to put together the arch, which will function well on the average. Truly an extraordinary outcome. And the outcome, as we are constrained to believe, of the processes of natural selection on the complex genetic structure which these insects bear. Insects like this, termites, learn little individually. All they know is coded deep within. They have very few tricks individually. It's hard to distinguish the actions of one from another. When you watch, you can measure the probabilities of actions, and it looks quite random, what one does, who, who succeeded in making... There are no outstanding pellet pilers among the termites. <laughs> I would like to dilate on this a little farther so as not to allow you to idealize the civilization. It's not a civilization, but it is an organic whole that we're looking at. Termites have a rather soft skin, which is not uh, damaged without much difficulty. And occasionally, a slightly wounded termite with a scratch or a little bit of a, of a nick in the skin will be walking down the access tubes, as you saw. And of course, as you noticed, tactile interaction is very strong. Every nest mate that that termite encounters will feel and groom a little bit. And if that tear, if that should be, appear serious, likely to acquire very solicitous examination indeed, until after a while the nest may be surrounded by half a dozen or a dozen, all anxious to stroke and feel and assess the, the state of health of their fellow citizen. By chance, in this worrisome press, very often, one of the insects will chance to tear it a little bit more and cause the exudation of a tiny drop of fluid. When this happens, the outcome is swift. That termite is rapidly consumed by his neighbors. Protein is always short among termites. There's no need to waste it. Individuality is minimal, and one termite is like another. And I think this moral justification supports the, uh, the, the, the terrible democracy of the termite uh, world. Now, how different is human architecture? How different? It rests quite plainly. Of course, we are social as they are. We are nothing without the collectivities from the earliest bands that wandered the African rift to the great uh, nation states and to the world community that we look forward to. But still, there are individual minds communicating and the store of experience in the individual, the internal model that the individual can make of what is going to happen in the future is the raw material for the selection of ideas, activities, content, which is the growth of human society, let us say of human architecture. We have found and enlarged a beautiful architectural drawing of about 1600 by the uh, Turin architect uh, Domenico Paganello, which is there. And no building of that sort existed when that beautiful rendering was made. That was a project which would come into existence, it may be, if the patrons were right and if the circumstances were correct, and if, the, if he was satisfied with that version. And of course, to eliminate that building, and we may be well sure that there were many pieces of paper before that, to eliminate those earlier pieces of paper did not require the expiration of the lifetime of Paganello and the failure of his building by structural failure, and then starting another dozen or a hundred Paganellos to see how their buildings turned out. Clearly, on that basis, uh, human architecture would proceed with extraordinary slowness. We have a culture which evolves in a different domain by the passage of language and artifact far more rapidly than could ever be said for the exchange of genetic material which lies behind the selection in their myriads of the termite nests. Now I would like to offer a conjecture, maybe a little startling. It is more than I could prove, but I find it very attractive to uh, consider it. Is there in fact a limit in kind to the operations of evolution in natural selection of the genetic material? 
have the termites reached some limit? Is our obvious, extraordinary complexity and wealth of culture and dominance of the world different in kind from that which the termites could attain by blind selection? In my opinion, it's not so. I see if they could make the true arch, I have no reason to doubt that sooner or later, I shall make a strong difference in a moment, but sooner or later, the termites could evolve, for example, if it were valuable to their survival, the manufacture of telescopes. Yes, and indeed radio telescopes as well. <laughs> I think you can see how it would work. It would begin with termites that collected rocks a little heavier than the sand around. There a lot of ores, you see. And then some nests would have found how to collect the heaviest ones, indeed, which would be copper, and not merely the iron or the lead that was lying around. In the, in the, and so it goes. And finally, fire, which they would take. And you can see how it would work. Uh, but, but now... <laughs> it's plain that if I were to list the rules that make an arch, even in a half-hearted way, I think you would agree, probably some tens of programmatic rules, like a listing for a very simple program in a computer, would do the job. But to list the rules in that same way, without an idea of a blueprint, without an idea of a final end, without an internal model, just letting events feed upon events in response to a few simple programmatic demands, such as now is the time to turn off the fire when it gets too hot. <laughs> it's plain to me that it would take a million listings. Would you doubt that? I don't think so. It might be 10 million. I have not tried to calculate it. A, a crude estimate of this sort suggests that that's what you would need. That's the number of books I'd expect to have to read, knowing a great deal to be able to build a telescope, starting from scratch. And I think it's plain. It would be of the order of millions of listings. But now the listings accumulated for the termites over tens of millions of years when our ancestors, a different species, but of the hominid strain, were arboreal in the African rift, the macrotermes were building, we are pretty sure, excellent arches. Their progress is painfully slow. And for me, that is the difference. That is what we represent as against the blindness of the disindividuated and learning free termites. They can't achieve anything that is in interest of their survival. I have a chance to do that. They're not certain, just as indeed we are not certain to fulfill our destinies. But they have a chance to fulfill their destinies at whatever you set, at whatever grandiose goal you set, provided you allow the depths of time, the caverns of time that is, that is required. But the world is not built to allow that time. No, the reason I think that we are distinct is not simply the kind of thing that we do. Yes, we do things different in kind from that of any other species. But we do so because we have built a new means of change so swift that it enables that evolution on an entirely different time scale. And that time scale, not the limit set by the intricacy of the method, but the limit set by time alone is the distinction between what I have called the blind paths of the genetic selection and the knowing, half-knowing paths of the internal model which we represent. That's the view I'd like to put forward. We are swift changers over the land and only by swiftness is it possible to make large change. That's all. Because what is given to us is the time set by the inexorable rules of the galaxy and the stars and that time is all the time that evolution can play. And to evolve such remarkable things as the structures which we are a part requires time beyond the time allowable to the processes of natural selection, of mutation and meiosis and uh, chromosome exchange and whatever else you will in the genetic material. That, I think, is the principal conclusion that I would like to draw. Now, let me add a few more points to try to tease out more of the differences between ourselves and these social animals, our fellows, our predecessors. Indeed, it may be our models, but models from which we are very much uh, diverged. I want now to make a simple, very simple arithmetical discussion, which is the nature of the most naive effort to show you one thing that you might well believe, but to show it in numerical terms so powerfully that it astonished me when I made the same simple calculation. 
The idea is this. We manipulate internal symbols. That's what I've said. That's our, that's our quality that makes it fast. You can utter words, draw papers, exchange uh, ideas, dance in a much shorter time than it takes to live a life. And that time, and of course far less, you then sum up also an internal structure of your own. You do not, like the termites, have one structure built in, and then that structure lasts all the life of the termite. It is never really much changed. There is no learning. We instead manipulate symbols. I won't speak of them. I'm going to use letters, but that's the most naive example. I don't really mean only letters. I want you to think of this in a general way that stands for any kind of manipulation of symbols. And I want to ask a simple question, it's only an arithmetical question. Therefore, it is not meant to be a model of the real world, but it's meant to suggest how the real world might work. If you had but three symbols, as perhaps a chimpanzee could master, or even a mammal less uh, related to our, to our uh, intelligence strain. I could imagine that they deal with three symbols, and of course, when if I ask for three symbols, there are three that come at once to mind. <laughs> MIT. And I will simply use those symbols. I'll try to exhaust for you, very simply, all the possible combinations of three symbols. Because that's what you could do if you're able to arrange three items, which isn't very much. You can make, of course, quite a number of combinations. And I will do it in a systematic way. So I'll put down the M, and then IT. And then I try the M again, and I can only exchange those two. And I've got everything to do beginning with M. And of course, I begin with I, and then I can add TM. And I can begin again with I and add MT, and that's all I can do beginning with I. And then I can try again. It's not very difficult. And I get <laughs> TMI, and I start with T again, and I invert and get IM. And now I've exhausted the canon of, of combinations with three symbols. It took uh, under a minute, half a minute. But now, what is remarkable, what is, I think, perhaps one of the most important of all arithmetical facts, is the following conclusion, which I only state, but I'm sure that many will be able to check my calculation. I don't think it's wrong. I was so astonished by it, I checked it three or four times. <laughs> Suppose I were to try the next word that I might think of, a good long word, technology. Well, I might bravely go out to do the same game on technology. How many ways can I rearrange this? So I'll try. T, C, E. But I'm sure you all agree it would be tedious to go through this whole operation. Even allowing for the fact this is not an honest ten-letter word, but has two letters repeated. If I were simply to write down at the same speed the number of variants of ten symbols with two repeats, taken ten at a time, as I had done here three at a time, the increase from three symbols to ten symbols makes the inordinate difference that instead of under a minute to write those, I would succeed in writing all the possibilities generated from technology only in lecturing eight hours a day, five days a week, for three academic years. <laughs> to write down. It's a simple consequence, of course, of elementary combinatorics, but we get so used to it People who deal with mathematics get used to these remarkable functional changes. But in fact, I think it's quite remarkable. And for me, it stands as a sign that it is most critical to develop an internal model of some strength. I can't say where that strength comes. I know that as you develop an internal model, which gets stronger and stronger, able to handle more and more complex orderings and reorderings of internal content, at some point, that will acquire an inordinate power and just before that point, its power will be quite minimal. And I think that is the distinction that we see between ourselves and the, our cousins, the friendly chimpanzees and the quiet gorillas. And of course, it also is the same kind of exponentiation which we see in the rise of culture itself. Now, I have to say more about internal models. I don't want to leave it just at that. It's much more important for us to examine if it is true that our real essence lies in this internal model building property, then it is up to us to try to understand what kind of models and how should we build them. This will influence our every thought. It is indeed our every thought. Now, I can see, and I think today it is apparent to all, two polar opposites in the world of model building. Two descriptions of models which we all know and use well, which are quite different in their nature. 
and they can be described in several different languages, several different terminologies, and I shall do that. The simplest one is to speak, of course, the foundation stone of our culture is probably, at least it has been for, let us say, a half a million or a million years, language itself. Language, you see, has a curious property. I suggest to the computer enthusiasts that language is very much, well, they call it machine language, yes. It is a combination of a few symbols repeated over and over and over again, interchanged and arranged, with no representative quality, no necessary iconic connection between the word and the world. Brass is not a yellow metal. Grass is not a green substance. The two words sound alike, but they mean something entirely different. This arbitrary mapping is the essence of the digital, the essence of language, the essence of algebra. The X can stand for anything. So language, algebra, and digital calculation I regard as three prototypes of one kind of model. I think you will take the meaning. The other kind of model is vision, geometry, and analog examples, physical systems. Those are very different in nature. They tend to have much more continuity, much more connection with the three and dimensional nature of the world and their position in time. They tend in many ways to be much more immediate than the powerful but strangely abstract ones we call language or algebra or digital calculation. Now, it is a popular thought these days, I've read it uh, from numerous authors, that indeed there's a logical difference between these two branches. That the, the stern, the uh, calculating, the uh, uh, objective mind deals in the digital, the symbolic, the algebraic. And the uh, light-hearted, uh, emotional, uh, unreflective, spontaneous mind deals in vision and uh, uh, geometry and, and such things. In my opinion, there is no strong logical difference between these two. I agree they represent two attributes of the human mind or of human minds. They are both represented, they're both indispensable. They both, in my opinion, allow a fully logical and indeed a fully artistic or emotional consequence either way. I don't see that the medium, in this case, will determine the quality of the message. I'm afraid that what happens in people who write books and articles know a lot about putting strings of symbols together and very little about drawing paintings. <laughs> and they think the, the art of the painter is spontaneous and carefree. And perhaps the, the painter on his part feels, well, putting all those symbols together as much what you did in kindergarten, but struggling to get exactly the right visual form on the canvas, that's a different matter, a more serious matter. <laughs> and I suspect they're both right. I mean, you see that the, the, the true situation is really more complex. And I would like to uh, engage a little more in discussion of uh, models of these two kinds and I want to say a little bit about how people make these models and what kind of models they are. In the west of England right across the country from the famous Cathedral of Canterbury there is another cathedral, the Cathedral of Wells and I would like to talk a little bit about what you may find at Wells Cathedral. Its facade is magnificently sculptured. This beautiful structure was begun about 800 years ago, a little more. And now we enter the cathedral. <clears throat> to find the cathedral clock. And the automata who joust up above as the hour is struck. <coughs> this clock was built in Chaucer's day. <coughs> we go up towards it, we see the great sunburst, which is the principal hand. That hand travels round the dial. Another dial within, marking the phases of the moon and bearing a beautiful inscription, which I shall use in a moment. As the day wears on from noon, the sun bursts the top. The sun will go right underneath to the bottom of the dial and back up again to the top 
turning once in 24 hours. A model, indeed, of the turning earth. Not, I may say, like our unfortunately degenerate watches, which when they have turning hands at all, <laughs> go round twice in a day. So willing are we to attenuate the model on which the clock is based. Now, do not think that this clock was primarily a practical matter. It was not open to the public at all for the first couple of hundred years after its installation. It was undoubtedly of use to the society of the canons of this cathedral, who had free access to it and could watch it, and perhaps could time their comings and goings and their uh, prayers as they chose. But it would be a mistake to think that that magnificent clock and its moon and day were built mainly to assist the proper scheduling of a cathedral society that probably knew perfectly well what to do each day of the year. No, the inscription tells us. It says, and I construe the Latin very freely, this circular dial presents the universe in microcosm. That's what it was for. The man who caused this clock to be built and the brilliant artisans, probably from probably Flemish and Belgian, who helped build this, were celebrating that order which they saw as the creators, exactly as those were who made the uh, scriptural sculptures in the facade. They were not doing any lesser task. It was not merely a practical timekeeper that they were building in that cathedral. I think every, uh, every human uh, inference leads to that point, and they said so in the face of the clock. Now, I think that that sense of model building, in this case the explicit analog model, which contains some measure of the truth of the time, namely the earth turning on its axis, or as they saw it, the heavens turning about the earth once every 24 hours, and the hand of the moon ingeniously contrived to slide behind by about that one hour per day, so that in the course of the month, the disk you saw which exposed the crescent moon would gradually slide around as well and go through the moon's phases as you watched. But now, of course, clocks have acquired a rather different quality. Not all of them. Some of them remain. But here we have this uh, quite handsome object, which is uh, there displaying the time for us all. And while it may have a hidden rotator, which still remembers very faintly that great rotation which it is mirroring. <laughs> it is really hidden. And all you see are the numerals that come to the face of the clock. And I venture to say that quite a few of you wear on the wrist a clock which has given up all semblance of rotation except in the abstract space of complex variables where there is a rotating vector still <laughs> whose oscillations give you the quartz crystal. But you see how abstractly we depart from models. And of course that is the story of the rise of scientific precision and scientific strength and scientific growth. And I think that, uh, that story is is real. But what I am trying to argue is that that story cannot be maintained as the only element of an appropriate structure of models, a schema of models for the human mind. It is too attenuated, it is too narrow, it is too thin, and we will not be fully nourished on such a diet. However precise and however numerous the bits which it can handle. When I open this wonderful book, which, by the way, is a joint uh, Anglo-American production, jointly computed by the authoritative staffs of the U.S. Naval Observatory and the Royal Greenwich Observatory, uh, representing two, more than 200 years of tradition for putting out the nautical almanac and ephemeris, and if I turn to today's date and look for the table which enters the moon, in which the moon is entered, I have a beautiful table, very precise. I have to report to you nine figures and some interpolation numbers which I'm afraid to count and they go through the hour and they will tell you hour by hour the position of the moon just as the cl great clock of Wells Cathedral has been doing for these 700 years but I think not so beautifully and not so richly and each to its own purpose I would not uh, uh, undervalue for a moment I would defend intensely 
the energy, the strength of human spirit, the cooperation, which has given rise to the digital tables of the nautical of, uh, almanac and ephemeris, which have freed us, for example, from the fear of the eclipse, which has become cataloged. Still awesome, still marvelous, but something now we recognize in that order of nature that we only partially perceive. Uh, all I would like to say is that that method, which I regard as absolutely indispensable to science, never to be done away with, and never to be, to be cannot be overpraised, is nevertheless not complete. It is not the whole story. It cannot be the whole story. It has never been the entire story. And at our peril, do we celebrate the tables and the digits and forget the simpler, the anal analogical, the visual, the sensory, which lies at the other pole of the internal representations of the world that we human beings must live by. Now, of course, I have come to the place where I can introduce that other domain of internal modeling, of representation, which is not science at all. That, of course, is art. I think you will at once admit that the sensory is, if not indispensable, at least the greatest part of all the arts in our history. We must appeal not to a string of digits, however elegantly assembled, however meaningful, but to a material system, whether it be of metal or canvas or even beams of light or sound, whatever it might be, which we can perceive by the senses, celebrate in the mind, regard as a representation, often subjective, not always, sometimes quite objective in representation, possibly with an image in it, possibly being with a metaphor. It can itself be as logically austere, I think, or as spontaneously free from logic as it chooses, provided only it embodies itself in a material base of some kind. And that we can apprehend through the senses. Now, we're fortunate enough to have before us an example of this sort of material. This beautiful ritual cooking vessel of the Shang civilization of China in the valley of the Yellow River was made by its artisans and designed by its artists and celebrated by its priests first about 3,000 years ago. That's such a, a, a vessel we're lucky enough to have. And I think it is fair to put this masterpiece of art and craftsmanship before us and to ask ourselves the question whether it's eloquent symmetry, whether it's fitness to the material, the cast bronze which it represents, could in any way be exhausted by describing it carefully in the geometrical position for every point and a, a code number for what material is there. Is it air? Is it copper? Is it uh, tin? Is it the patina? I think this long string of numbers, which logically is equivalent, and which indeed can generate and does generate for the television audience just the picture that we see, is nevertheless not the same as the object which is in front of you. It must be transmitted to us through a sensory channel. And I think that is the lesson which art brings to us, and it is richly brought in this particular example. I uh, am moved to comment on the form itself. You recognize, perhaps, the animal face, the symmetrical face, much distorted, much abstracted, which nevertheless resides in the careful finish of the design. And even uh, more striking, the artful use of these flanges as a piece of the design, where it is pretty clear that they are indispensable to the technique of manufacture, to the piece molding which enabled the artisans of 3,000 years ago to put this together. But so much were they imbued with the notion that the object was in a material, a real material, and not simply an abstract model in the mind, that they fused the ideas together and made the material and the form cooperate in presenting to us a work of beauty, which 
across a world of time and society, a gulf we can hardly cross, still I think speaks to us with extraordinary care and eloquence of this speaking from such an ancient time. If I have to draw some conclusion from what I have said, I must hold that it is true that we operate primarily in a different time scale. And since we have a different time scale, we therefore have a different scale of complexity and performance and error as well, I would say, than the beings, the creatures of the termite nest modifying the environment across the Australian plains. We are different. But that difference does not lie in the fact of evolution. It does not lie in the limits to which life can attain. It lies in the remarkable ability that we have acquired from an inborn evolutionary choice to build the model building possibilities beginning a million years ago and perhaps reaching the present state uh, some tens of thousands, 40 or 50,000 years ago. There seems to be no change in our species, no important biological change in our species since then. The most eloquent argument for which is, I think, examining the artifacts of the upper and middle Paleolithic, the paintings in the cave, the mobiliary art, the possible symbols inscribed on the walls, and recognizing they are persons like ourselves, whose absence of a great cultural legacy, whose smallness against the forces of nature around them, made their accomplishments modest, but magnificent in potential. And we are presumably trying to eventuate that potential in our lifetime. Now that we are 4 billion people and not 400,000 persons on the face of the earth. This release of time is of course the key point that I have tried to stress. But it is a release of time which is possible, I think, only if we remember as we can hardly easily forget, but as the academic may be inclined to forget from time to time, that we have rich model building propensities, that every life indeed builds models, that the unlettered as well as the professorial are constantly, as we must for our own internal survival, foreseeing the future, modeling the consequences of every event, looking at the fall of the easel or the rain outside and understanding what will happen not by an experience and a feedback mechanism maybe once but not a second time as a proverb tells us <laughs> we learn from experiences we construct the internal model which is the only way that we have of managing our individual lives and our social our cultural exchange that language from our society in which we are embedded from earliest youth now I will admit to a deficiency in this beautiful set of objects that I've talked about and admired. It's an evident deficiency. What I have talked about and what I have been able to show with the help of our good friends is only the sunniest of the landscapes which the human mind has illuminated, which human society has constructed in its uh, million years or 40,000 years, or 10,000 years, whatever time span you choose to mark your statement of what our continuity is. And I would be the f dishonest were I not to admit that besides the sunny landscapes, I could have shown, and I will mention, dark and ugly ones. You can add to the list for yourself, but I will mention only a few. There are the craters, the bomb craters pockmarking the rice paddies, the demilitarized zone in the Indochina Peninsula. There is the wreckage of the houses in the South Bronx and the travesty of a city community in Soweto, far away in the tip of Africa. Add your own, you will not be surprised. Those too are consequences of the power of human society to envision the consequences of its, of its acts and to, s to construct them social, physical, informational. Yes, indeed, 
in the realm of idea alone, for they extend beyond the material, certainly to the domain of ideas. Our power to shape is a power for good and for evil. There is no more obvious comment that I could make than that. And when I have said that, I will not close despairingly, for I think we have very good reasons not to do so. What our power for shaping means seems to me it's double. It implies responsibility for those forms we make. And since we can shape the world, and can sometimes shape it well, it implies, I believe most firmly, hope as well for the forms we can make in the landscape. And now I would like my old friend, Jacob Bronowski, to have the last word. Man is a singular creature. He has a set of gifts which make him unique among the animals, so that, unlike them, he is not a figure in the landscape, he is the shaper of the landscape. transcript, send $2 to this address. Major funding for NOVA is provided by this station and by other public television stations. Additional funding is provided by grants from TRW and the National Science Foundation. Thank you.